is perfect. Okay, so um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the ABCD GIS, uh, Harvard Technical GIS talk series um, for March 2016. We're happy to have uh, Devika Kakar with us. Devika holds a master's degree in geodesy and geoinformation science from the Technical University of Berlin. And currently she's interning with us at the Center for Geographic Analysis. And we are uh, delighted to have her because she has so many skills and she does so much great project work for us. Um, and she's going to talk today. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Devika. Thank you. So I would like to welcome you all to my today's presentation. It's already on. Okay. Yeah. So I'll be talking about indoor navigation using two technologies. One is Wi-Fi and one is ultra wideband. So first the question comes, why do we need indoor navigation? And in what scenarios can we use indoor navigation? First of all, we can use it for navigating humans inside buildings and indoor environment. Then you can use it for emergency responses in case of fire and planning your emergency exits from a building. Indoor navigation is also used nowadays in many sports like football and uh, for indoor stadiums. More and more stadiums are going indoor and you can use it to plan the trajectory of the players and then make your game, game plan and all. Then also in medical purposes nowadays, indoor navigation is used for surgeries and other stuff. And of course, it's a very, very important area for robotics. Just a brief introduction of what a typical indoor positioning system looks like. So uh, indoor positioning system receives the signals. It uses some positioning techniques to do this. The positioning technique uh, can be a time of arrival, time difference of arrival of the signals, the received signal strength, and other parameters. So with, the, uh, with these techniques, we estimate the location parameters. And these location parameters are used to then find the user location using the different positioning algorithms. So your input is your signal and the output is the user location. So the first part of my presentation, I'll discuss my graduate student project done at Technical University of Berlin, which was done using Wi-Fi. So for, uh, why, do, why did we use Wi-Fi and what are the advantages of using Wi-Fi? The first and foremost advantage is the lower cost. Then you have easy deployment. You have public transmitters fitted in the building, which can be used for localization. Then there's a wide availability of Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is accurate uh, to meters of accuracy, which is sometimes sufficient enough for indoor loca uh, localization. <coughs> then in inside environment, the GPS fails. So Wi-Fi is the solution or uh, alternative for it. And the Wi-Fi is locally georeferenced to the building geometry. That is why we decided to use the Wi-Fi for a project. This is the study area where we did our proof of concept. It's the main building of Technical University of Berlin. It's like you can say it's the most visit, one of the most visited building on the campus, having the different departments as well as the student center, the admissions office, and all. So it was a point of interest for us to do our proof of concept on this building. And as you can see, it's a huge building with almost nine floors. So just uh, to brief on what the project workflow was or what were the different parts of the project. The first part, we wanted to make a topographic space model of the building. With topographic space, I mean mapping the interior built environment of the building. Then we, uh, the second part was to map the sensor space which was capturing the signal reception area of the building. Then in the third part, we build a connection between the topographic space and the sensor space. And finally, we did the localization, which included specifying the database schema of the two space layers and using our positioning algorithms to find the user location. And uh, in, in further parts of my presentation, I'll be discussing each of these steps in details. Mm -hmm. So first, uh, I want to tell you what uh, the concept of the model was uh, for this project. So this uh, concept is known as multi-layer space event model. 
In this, we represent our building or the built environment in form of a topographic layer, which you can see in form of 3D space cells in blue. <coughs> and the sensor space or the Wi-Fi is represented as a sensor space layer. Then we finally overlap these two layers and establish a connection between them to do our localization. To build our topographic space layer, we started with the building CAT input plans, input models of CAT. And um, from those CAD input models, we extracted our flow plan for the various flows of the main building. And you can see in the picture a simple CAD flow plan of one floor of the building. Then from these uh, CAD flow plans, we extruded 3D cells uh, by excluding each flow plan to its room height. Uh, so this is exclusion of free spaces and do doors from the simplified flow plan. Then from these excluded um, free spaces or this excluded model, we built a city GML LOD4 model of the building. So this is what we use, uh, FKZ uh, Viewer uh, from KIT. It's a free software which you can use to view your city GML LOD4 models. And um, uh, on the left, you see... Uh, the city GML4 model of one floor, and on the right, you see for the whole of the building. So uh, to brief you on the concept of topographic modeling is that each room is a cell. Each room is a 3D cell, and each door is a cell. And uh, in the middle uh, figure, in the middle, you'll see that each room is represented by a node. And then we connected these nodes to establish a connection and to tell about the connectivity between different rows, uh, between different rooms and the spaces in the building. So this is the result from our project that each uh, cell was represented by a node. And the connection between two cells was represented by an edge of the graph. So this was the graph structure which we obtained finally for our topographic space model. Can you, will you explain how you dealt with elevators and stairs? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's not shown in detail here, but uh, if you read the article on this, then you'll find it. Elevators and uh, stairs be represented as vertical cells. And uh, then connection between different flows was, again, an edge connecting the uh, different flow levels. One problem we had with elevators and stairs is these are we took care that these are non-overlapping uh, geometries all the doors and they are separated by the boundary of the wall and elevators and stairs we had to represent two as non-overlapping although they are connecting to each other but uh, for this project we took them as non-overlapping and connected with the edge connecting the two nodes of the elevators on different flows so that you can see the edge yes We have the elevator stairs also uh, because they are useful for disabled people who want to find the path for people who are not able to take the stairs. They want to take the elevator. So that was important to represent them. <clears throat> then uh, this uh, graph structure can be used for path planning. <clears throat> and we did a simple query in ArcGIS and uh, to find the way from the main uh, from the exit to the lab, and this is the result of a uh, path search using ArcGIS. And this entire graph structure was specified using a database schema in Oracle 11G. So all your um, properties and the specifications of these graphs and edges go into the database, which you can further use to query and do your path planning. Similar to uh, topographic space, it is also important to represent your sensor space or um, to model it in a way that it can be used to establish a connection between your sensor space and topographic space. So the idea behind this is, say, we have two sensors, A and B, and we have a, they are, their signal strengths are overlapping at AB. So we represent each um, sensor as a separate identity, and then uh, the overlapping area is used to establish the connection between the two sensor nodes. And what if there are six nodes overlapping? Exactly the same thing? Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll go in detail into that. So this was a measurement scenario on one floor. So the idea was to create a one-by-one-meter grid on the floor. 
and to measure the received signal strength on that uh, point so as to give us the uh, so if you can see in the table we have the mac and the signal strength from the mac for every point there were some points which we were not able to take measurements because of furniture or because of uh, walls and other so those points were pruned from this grid they were removed because there was no measurement present there but we wanted a spatially continuous um, uh, layer for that we use the uh, interpolation technique in ArcGIS that is IDW inverse distance weighing <clears throat> to create a sensor space layer which is continuous and uh, which do, uh, which does take into account the different obstruction present in the building so if you can see this is a example of one of the space layer from one of the flows which we had prepared and uh, you can see the signals in red are the places where there are strong signals and then they go mild and then they go lower on the edge of the building <clears throat> If uh, anybody is interested in uh, reading about which interpolation technique to use in ArcGIS, then I have an entire study. We have done an entire study on different techniques of interpolation in ArcGIS and which one works might work better for Wi-Fi signals. So I can in the references, yeah, in the references there's a report which uh, tells the different results with different interpolation techniques like IDW, creating and all, and uh, why which one works best and what problems we had with other techniques. So what we did after preparing the, we prepared this interpolation layer for different transmitters present on the flow. There were around nine transmitters on one of the flows. And then we did a merge operation in ArcGIS to get our, our final space layer cell. So that uh, here you can see the final sensor space layer, which was for, uh, uh, formed after doing the merge of different transmitter signal strengths. And uh, here in the table, we, you can see that uh, what the different areas are representing and what is the range of signals we are getting in that area. Then again, in the, again, we followed the same procedure to build the graph node structure for this space layer. So every, every single entity in this is represented by a node. And the overlapping and the connectivity between two space layers is represented by an edge in the graph. So this is quite similar to the procedure we followed in the topographic layer of the building. Now the next step was to form a connection between our topographic space and the sensor space, uh, which we will use later for localization and positioning. So you can see on the top that we did an overlapping of the topographic space model of uh, the building and with the sensor space and also connected the graph structure of the sensor space with the graph structure of the topographic space on the bottom. Now, there are two ways uh, we thought we can do the localization in this, is that the sensor space layer was also, also mapped to a database schema in Oracle 11G. And we have the database schema from topographic space. So we can use this database schema to do the localization. Or uh, we can also use a very interesting algorithm, a very famous algorithm for Wi-Fi localization, which is called location fingerprinting. So I just want to tell briefly about this algorithm that in uh, sorry. Can I ask a question about that previous graph? Um, so what? Maybe you said, but what determined the positions on the sensor space of the nodes? How was that determined? Ah, uh, yeah. The 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 position of the node is the centroid of the centroid. cell. So every building cell's centroid is taken as the node position to go in the Euclidean space geometry. So if I have a cell, I find its centroid and I say, here is my node. Okay, but on this on the sensor space, you, you don't have a. It doesn't look like there's a node every meters. Or every meter around. No, it's every centroid. But, but the top half. The top is the every centroid. Centroid is all those functions. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's, that's a strange uh, thing. But uh, the. Look at the pale green one on the, on the right hand side. You see a centroid. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the, so a room can be a cell? One room or no? It can be a cell if the signal strength is uniform over the room. It can be, or it can be uh, multiple cells with the different signal strengths of the. So uh, what we had with one by one Same meter was yeah. the beginning. We measured the signal strength. Then we did the merge. We obtained a final sensor space layer. We are no longer dealing with one by one meter, but we have a interpolated layer for the whole floor. 
and then this polygon centroid is the node in the graph structure finally if you're if you're measuring it one node, mm -hmm. why do you have to interpolate because there were uh, many points which we were not able to take the measurement so the surface was not continuous because you have furniture and there were uh, obstructions on the walls you are not able to take the measurements and a lot of laps were there where we were not able to move the stuff around so it was not that your grid was a uniform one by one meter if you can see in the grid many many parts the measurements has not been possible yeah, right. yeah. so we use interpolation and extrapolation in our gis to make that surface so so the connections are important here right you just want to know for any of the topographic space nodes which sensor exactly is going to be the one that it has access to Exactly. Well, no, has, they have access to several of them right. with they have different several, strengths. Right. <clears throat> they have access to several, but I think connection is the key here. Right. How well your connection is will determine your accuracy. Right. How well you are able to map. That is why we used a one by one meter grid, so that we rely on real measurements rather than on interpolated measurements while making that connection. Yep. So I was talking about location fingerprinting. Uh, this is a widely used algorithm because um, what we do here is we make a database of our radio signal strengths. In our case, it was the received signal strength indicator of the Wi-Fi, which you can see here. In this table, that we have the signal strength of one minus one twenty dBm minus ninety dBm. This goes to our database, and the fingerprint. Uh, in the first step of fingerprinting is the offline phase or training phase. In this phase, uh, what is done is that we make a radio map. We do our measurement. We make a grid of one by one meter. We take a measurement, and we make the radio map of the transmitter. So the radio map is consists of the received signal strength indicator, and it also consists of the coordinates, the x, y coordinate of the measurement point, which we will later use in the localization um, part. and. Part two is the online phase or the positioning phase. Here you apply a fingerprinting algorithm to locate the user. And uh, this fingerprinting database can consist of signal strength, it can consist of angular power profile, or it can consist of delay power profile of the signal. It is not that you always have to use RSSI. <laughs> Depends on which parameter you want to use. But in our case, it was the received signal strength. So we combine these two phases, that is the offline phase and the online phase. Uh, is combined in the uh, location fingerprinting and you can see that in offline phase we have different APIs we take their measurement uh, whatever the MU is a mobile user what measurements the mobile user is getting from the different API and we store them in our database which consists of XY of the measure point and the received signal strength in part B that is the online phase you know the received signal strength which the mobile user is getting but you don't know the X and Y coordinate of the mobile user which you have to find and that is what the algorithm does. It gives us the XY location of the mobile user from these received signal strength on his mobile. So this is one uh, screenshot from our results. You can see the actual lo location in green and the estimated location in red. And these two locations were around 3 meters distance from each other. So with this algorithm and with using Wi-Fi, the localization accuracy is 3 to 6 meters. I have a detailed report on localization fingerprinting and how it works along with the mathematics behind this algorithm, which is there in the reference if somebody is interested in reading it. So, I have a question before yeah. you move on. Um, are there uh, temporal factors that will affect the signal strength of a room for people, for example? Yeah. Versus an empty room, or maybe someone's rearranged the furniture a little bit. Yeah, very, very good. Well, yeah, I don't know if the weather comes into I mean, humidity, yeah, maybe, or something. No. Not sure. I don't know. This is a very interesting question, and I was going to discuss this in the next part. So, what happens with Wi Fi is there are a number of factors that affect your accuracy and your signal strength. Is uh, Wi Fi suffers from multipath? I don't know if you know what multipath is, that the signal does not travel in a straight line. It travels in a multiple path because it is reflected by the obstructions you have, by the table, if somebody is moving, if there's a wall there. And all of these affect the accuracy of your signal. So there are multiple things which you need to take into account when you are using Wi-Fi, that these are the 
if you see in this, I, me I mentioned in this slide, this is a typical positioning algorithm. So what I say by range and direction error is the uh, error introduced by these different um, uh, scenarios of multipath, the error introduced by obstruction, by reflection of the signal, by refraction of the signal and everything. That is why your typical indoor positioning system takes into account the range and direction error. So there are multiple techniques by which you can take care of these. But uh, we didn't take care of this in our project. And uh, by not taking care of this, we still got an accuracy of 3 to 6 meter, which was sufficient for our user case scenario. But you can get better accuracy if you take care of this. Now, one of the in interesting reasons uh, why I wanted to discuss ultra-wideband here is that ultra-wideband provides more accurate localization compared to Wi-Fi. So if you want to go into centimeters, then I think ultra-wideband is the technology you would like to go for. And the multipath effect in ultra-wideband is dealt better than Wi-Fi. So you can deal in a better way with a multipath effect in ultra-wideband than you can do in Wi-Fi. And you get rid of these positioning errors in a sense. So the next part of my presentation is uh, indoor navigation using ultra-wideband. So this was one project we were working on with Fraunhofer Institute, the location and communication department there. What uh, first I will say why they wanted to use ultra wideband and what was the motivation behind this project? First of all, they wanted centimeters accuracy. That is why they wanted to go for ultra wideband, and they wanted to build their own localization platform for ultra wideband, which they can later take to the market. And uh, one of the very important uh, aspects of indoor localization is not only what technique you are using, but what algorithm you are using. What is your positioning algorithm? That also determines your accuracy. What, like in Wi-Fi case, we were using location print fingerprinting, but there are other uh, algorithms also which are present which can be used. So we thought, while well, dealing with ultra wide band, that we wanted to try the different positioning algorithm and which one to use uh, when and in which scenario, and to compare the various Bayesian filters, which are very, very popular in indoor positioning, and which one would work the best for our case scenario. This is also one of my expertise area is uh, design of these algorithms and the comparative analysis and stuff. That is what I worked on here, is uh, we wanted to compare several filtering algorithms to obtain accurate results. And we wanted to further improve the accuracy of our ultra-wide band system by using a very, very efficient algorithm. So. A part of this work was to study the different Bayesian algorithms and to find out in which scenario which algorithm would work the best. So in my study, I did a comparison of two algorithms. One is hyperbolic, uh, three algorithms. One is hyperbolic positioning. This is a very standard algorithm which is normally used. So it's the very basic that every uh, we use the time of arrival values from the ultra -wide band platform. So every time of arrival, uh, we from the time of arrival, we can calculate the time difference of arrival of the signal. And every time difference of arrival gives you a, a parabola, hyperbola, along which you can position your transmitter. So the intersection of this hyperbolic hyperbols is your, loca uh, is your location. So it's just nothing. It's just intersecting your different hyperboles, which you uh, find by your or uh, time difference of arrival mm -hmm. values and intersecting is. This is the standard method which is used. But we wanted to go to filtering algorithms like the Kalman filter and the particle filter and to see if we can get a better accuracy with them. And we tried two filters. One was extended Kalman filter, and the other was cost difference particle filter. I don't want to go into the mathematics behind mm -hmm. these filters because uh, that will need another presentation to discuss in detail, but to just give a short uh, overview of what happens with Kalman and cost difference particle filter is that in Kalman filter, the normal Kalman filter you use when your system equation is linear and the noise is Gaussian. And uh, the extended Kalman filter you use when the noise is Gaussian, but your system is nonlinear, which was the case in our, because our system is the distance, our state equation is the distance, which is a nonlinear function. And the normal Kalman filter cannot be applied to it. So we tried the extended Kalman filter. And um, then we tried the cost difference particle filter. So what the cost difference particle filter does is that it's one form of particle filter where you say my system, where you define your cost equation of your system, and you try to minimize the cost. 
minimize the cost and get the best possible position of the user. So uh, here I can show you the uh, localization platform, which was built at Fraunhofer. And it consists of the transmitter part, which was a UWB generator producing the UWB pulse. And uh, we worked in the range of 2 to 11 gigahertz band. Then we had a receiver part, which was a Lecroy oscilloscope with 16 gigahertz analog bandwidth. And we had a GUI, which you can see in the black, that was running on the oscilloscope. And uh, it was running the energy detection algorithm and the position calculation algorithm both. And we had the receiver in antennas with the UWB antennas and noise amplifiers. So here you can see this was our uh, experiment area. On the corners of the uh, four corners of the wall, we have the receiver anchors of ultrawideband. And what you see uh, in the middle is the transmitter antenna. So what we wanted to do is to locate this transmitter antenna, keeping our receiver anchors fixed on the four corners of the wall. So just up here. to find the position of the receiver anchors, we use the fiducial marks on the receiver antennas to tell us the true position of the antenna and the face center of the transmitter antenna was used to find the position of the transmitter antenna. And here you can see that we have the position of the four anchors in X, Y, and Z coordinate. Now, what we did for our experiment that it was a four by nine meter room with the grid on the floor, which you can see. And um, uh, <coughs> we had a moving train. And on the train, we fixed our transmitter antenna and the sensor, which you can see in the figure. And uh, we, uh, our, our idea was to find the trajectory of this train as it moves along the path and to uh, do the positioning of this one. OK. So first, we implemented the usual hyperbolic positioning algorithms for this. And then we moved on to extended Kalman filter and cost difference particle filter. And this is the graph of the results of the three different algorithms. So you can see that how the accuracy gets better with extended Kalman filter. And it gets even better if you go to the particle filter. So in the green is the hyperbolic standard algorithm. Then in the blue, you see the extended Kalman filter. And in the red is the cost difference particle filter, which was found to be very accurate. And all our accuracy is in centimeters here. You see the difference even more when you go to the third dimension. That hyperbolic positioning gets worse when you're treating the third dimension. But in case of filtering and using Bayesian filters, your third dimension is getting better. And so that is why I think it's very important that we take into consideration what algorithm we are running in the background to use our sensor data and ultimately local, uh, locating the user. This was one objective of this study. And what we find uh, found out is that, if you can see, it's the root mean square error of the various algorithms. We found out that particle filter works well with a system where you don't, we, where you have an unknown uh, system model, which was, in our case, we were not uh, knowing the kind of noise the system is having, the kind of errors we have to deal with. So we specified our own cost equation for the system, and we tried to minimize it. And, um, <clears throat> Such kind of ultrawide band system can also work good with extended Kalman filter. And if you are not so worried about the accuracy, then of course, hyperbolic positioning is very simple and easy to implement. But uh, cost different particle filter is a bit complex to implement and needs a lot of data modeling. Yep. So I think that's all I have from my side. I'm open to questions. Thank you. Just uh, quickly, I can show you the references that if somebody's interested in reading more on the wireless localization technique of fingerprinting, then here are the differences, the interpolation techniques. And then I have my two detailed paper describing these three algorithms from ultra wide band. So I think these references are very useful if you want to go into detail. What are the costs and time frames uh, to retrofit a single floor in a building uh, either uh, with ultra wide band, you are not doing uh, much of measurements because everything goes in your oscilloscope. You get the time of arrival there, and what you are doing is simply setting up the system, mm -hmm. and you are make the time. The most of the time I spend is making these algorithms because you the you have to spend time if you are going for particle filter time to model your system. The more accurate modeling you can do of your system, the more accuracy you will get. But 
in terms of measurement, you are not doing much. You are just running your train. But in case of Wi-Fi, we were working a team of 15 students, I guess. And we, uh, for one floor, uh, five to six students were working. And we took a few weeks to complete the measurement of one by one meter grid. But that is one disadvantage of fingerprinting algorithm, that uh, building the database is very, very time intensive. So once you have the database, things are easier. But to get that database is where you spend most of your time. And the cost me, of the uh, receiving nodes? Sorry, cost of the? The uh, nodes that you're placing uh, as a receiver. In the ultrawide band system? Yeah, uh, what, are the, what are their average? I, I, I'm not sure of the exact cost. There are a few, uh, few thousand euros, uh, but not that. For Wi-Fi, it's most cost effective because you have the publicly available transmitters and you can even put your own transmitters which are not that costly but i can say that ultra wide band is more intense in terms of cost you have to spend more to get this ultra wide band system there and you have to spend for your oscilloscope and the antennas and the anchors you can save a few thousand euros yeah you talked about a three to six meter accuracy yeah. when you're dealing with a extremely large building Hundred thousand square, fifty thousand square meter building or something like that. Or yep. It's so really large. My my question is, <clears throat> if you were on a single floor, very few obstructions, would the increase incre the accuracy increase? Of course, the accuracy will increase if you have less obstruction because your signals will get better and better. So uh, if you can see here, I don't know if I have that figure, but if you go to my references then there's a figure which shows that the place where there are more obstructions on the building uh, the signal strength is very weak and it's not that good because of multipath and obstructions but where you have less obstructions then your signal strengths get better and better and even you can see that in the interpolation layer when you do the final interpolation in ArcGIS that yeah it's getting better so if you were in for example open laboratory mm -hmm. without walls you've got a couple of transmitters you probably have what down to half a meter or less than a meter, quarter of a meter? I mean, it depends on not only, it depends on a number of factors or what is your positioning algorithm, how well you are dealing with your errors, and also how much obstructions are there. So I cannot give you a number that okay. will be your accuracy because it's dependent on many factors. Uh, but but other the people range have could done be. This type of work, right? Yes, so, and they have, all, most of them have got in meters <coughs> from Wi Fi. You can go to three meters or five meters or even less. but. Uh, I have not heard, uh, Matlab, with the ultra wide band, it was for us, it was a four by nine meter room, and our uh, accuracy was in centimeters. So you are dealing with a much smaller room uh, with ultra wide band, but then uh, the multipath and all is dealt better. Yeah. Can I ask, so you talked about setting up models and algorithms for interpreting the signal strengths. Can you talk a little bit about the client? Like, is there a mobile client that? Oh, yeah. um, free or you developed or how does that work? So uh, we didn't develop a client application. Our client application was mostly uh, analyzing it in um, GIS or the CAD Pro Plus. This was uh, how we found our uh, location of the actual and estimated location. But there was no such uh, graphical user interface, if I understand correctly. You mean a GUI? Basically, um, how would you get if I had a cell phone and you had set up this whole system, mm -hmm. what would I use on my cell phone to, to guess my position? Is yeah, there a we, plan to install or so some we, way of measuring my signal strength and comparing it with the algorithm's pre-calculated results? And how does it work? So this was a proof of concept of okay. this. Yeah, so uh, we didn't uh, go into making the user interface for this, but to analyze our own results, we used the CAT4 plan on our computer mm -hmm. and we ran our algorithm with the signals and we saw the values there of what accuracy we are getting. And yep. you actually probably measured your signal strength mm -hmm. using not a cell phone, but a Wi-Fi signal strength measurer. Yes, yeah. we used a laptop fitted with the network adapter and yeah. uh, used wireless MON software, which is uh, which gives you the MAC address as well as the signal strength right. to make our right. database. So it looks to me that the, the two techniques that you use, the first technique, the uh, Wi-Fi, so it's only in place and you can just go ahead, everybody can basically apply what, what you need. But the second technique is more, is more complex, we like to kind of an experiment. So there is a kind of a 
a road that uh, had it, uh, you can apply because those devices have to be put it on everyone, basically, as a Wi Fi and just for these, these kind of things, not nothing else. So, like, <coughs> Wi Fi that can be used for something like um, Wi Fi and also for navig internal navigation. The second, the, the second thing is something I would say it can be used only for, for internal navigation, that's all. It's correct. Yeah, for the second technique, uh, the main part is setting up your experimental test bed, uh, your anchors and your oscilloscope. So in my team, I had a person who, is an, who was a UWB expert. So he was dealing with the electronics part of the signals. And then I was one person who was dealing with the algorithms running behind. So uh, for the second technique, you will need a person who, uh, who is an algorithm expert who can take, take those signals and design your algorithm to give you the position, and a person who is signal expert, maybe, so to deal this with The question is that this system has no other purpose. Unlike Wi-Fi, served as Wi-Fi for everything else. Mm -hmm. So your positioning act, um, and navigation is just a byproduct of your Wi-Fi deployment. Versus this methodology, you would have to invest into the whole thing just for this project and no other. Oh, no, 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 no. The th this system has application. I'll tell you one of the applications. I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. Yeah, very well. <laughs> I thought. <laughs> so this system uh, would uh, has application in indoor stadiums. You have uh, on the four uh, walls of the indoor stadium, you have your transmitters, and then the tra uh, you have your receivers, and the transmitter goes in the shoes of the player. So when he is running, uh, you can track his uh, movement, and that movement can be used for game planning. So, so it's still, it's only a navigation sensing system. It's not also a communication system. That's no, exactly this is a navigation system. system. You could probably figure out how to make a phone call over at UWB if you were really... Oh, that's fine. Thank you. I mean, no, I'm thinking about US, US yeah. school, and invest in that kind of uh, technology, it would be very costly because you have to... Yeah. Just and presumably yes. the motivation would be it's sufficiently more accurate and it matters to you yeah. that you would spend money on yeah. achieving that accuracy. For me, I would say that these kind of systems have users in military mm -hmm. where they need accuracy yeah. of centimeters and they are ready to invest in yeah. that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and also uh, for sports, uh, sports they have money and they want to invest in very accurate system to get the trajectory of their players mm -hmm. because it can change the entire game plan and the trajectories are live when the player is running around with the sensor you get the live trajectory and you know what is going on and yeah one, one practical problem with the wi-fi system is the necessity to go and do a very detailed survey you know meter grid mm -hmm. or something to get these fingerprints have you uh, looked at all at, at the kind of accuracy you might get if you just took one or two measurements per room. Uh, you know, it, if you say, well, you know, five or six meter, you know, five meter accuracy might be enough for me, okay? But um, just the cost of acquiring <clears throat> the fingerprints is high, particularly if you have a large building or a large campus. So I'm wondering how much you give up in your accuracy by taking fewer sample points. I think that is what uh, we considered that point, and that is discussed in detail in my report on interpolation techniques on how when you remove certain grid points, how your sensor layer changes. And what we did is we removed few of the points, and then we did our interpolation and see how close is. For example, I have, for example, I have a measurement for a certain point, which I know what the measurement is, and then I made my interpolation layer and I compared how close it is to actual. Uh, measurement, and we found that the more points you have, the better interpolation layer you'll have in the end. Sure. Yeah. But but uh, that's true. But the question is, what's where do the curves cross for the cost and the yeah. benefit? How hard is it to measure every centimeter <laughs> and get really good 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 precision versus two measures? Yeah, uh, centimeters. I, that's what I'm saying. I, that's what I discussed in my report uh -huh. on where you can. We didn't define a certain thing that okay, at, at five meters you'll have this problem, or but uh, you can go like three meters, two meters also. One by one meter is not needed. Yeah. It's not that you have to take every one by one meter, but uh, we didn't do that specific uh, comparison of where is your uh, peak point where you can. Uh -huh. Well, so the question is what kind of accuracy might you get if you only did you know, three meter or five meter sampling? Did you look at that? No. We just looked at uh, how the uh, points are changing your inter our interpolation layer and how that would uh, affect the measured value
to to the estimated value and uh, how will it affect the estimated value at the location where we did not take the measurement and how close we will be if we take more points i'm sorry i guess so it's you know and ask for the real number unless you have real numbers <laughs> yeah <laughs> there's always the saying that the stronger your wi-fi signal the more accurate your results will be but i have a hard time conceptualizing that it seemed to me that the more stable whether strong or weak the more stable your wi-fi signal is the more accurate your interpretation your estimation, triangulation method, well, not triangulation, but estimation of your location could be. The reason I say that is that um, if your Wi Fi antenna, right, uh, beeping out uh, signals, sometimes strong, sometimes weak, then the distance to that point would be a variable fluctuating. And that introduces to your uncertainty. But if it's stable but weak, that's okay. Because if you have that measurement, you've, you've laid out the zones to each particular loca location, right? The, the strengths, the location is all mapped out. When you have three, four different ones and the overlapping area could be correctly pinpointed, it doesn't matter, it's weak. As long as it's consistently that weak. Exactly. I think you're right. So what uh, if we see the fingerprinting algorithm, so even if our signal is weak, but it's the fingerprint of the Wi-Fi, every time you are getting that weak signal and you have that fingerprint, which you can use to say, okay, if I'm getting minus 120 dBm, I am in this location, but that, that should be stable. Should, if it changes very frequently, then this database is of no use. Well, and I think you are right. Wi-Fi transmitters, do they vary a lot? Single transmitter will it vary? Will it signal strength well, vary? Well, the variation would be like furniture to me, it continues yeah. to the bouncing component. Mm -hmm. of right, there's full room or something. Just mm -hmm. a single yeah. thing sitting there, is it going to do this or is it pretty much going to be this thing? Know. It can do this. It can mm -hmm. go up and down, but it, normally it doesn't, but it can, of mm -hmm. course. And uh, people moving around and something. Could yes. Be yeah. If you room. yeah, if you increase the obstructions, if you increase the multipath, of course it can vary. And one of the disadvantage of fingerprinting is that if you remove one of your transmitter points, mm -hmm. the uh, IT people keep on changing. So if mm -hmm. I have a MAC address, I have here, I make my database, and they change the structure of the MAC or the transmitters, mm -hmm. then you have to remake your databases. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, and your entire intense work has to be done again. So this is one disadvantage mm -hmm. we found in location fingerprinting. Mm -hmm. But for our project, we told the IT people, if they change anything, they should let us know and should not change for next three months, maybe, because this project was going on. But if your model is correct, you can update the database yes, based yes. on their change without having to go out there and yeah. redo your sampling. Yeah, that's what we told them. They should inform us if they make any change so that we can update our database and use that. So if we, if if you want to go with Wi-Fi's, and we know the location of all the Wi-Fi's in our building, um, in order to create the database, what do we need to have in that data database? Yeah, so you need to have the RSSI as well as the XY coordinate of your measured position. Okay. The received signal strength indicator, how much signal strength you're getting, and what the is strength. the position at which you are getting that signal strength. For us, it was this thing was measured every one by one meter of the room. To make our database, but you can deal with other so other parameters. You said X Y, but you really need X Y Z because you're going. If to you want to go to third more. dimension, yeah. yeah. For uh, this uh, this project, we kept the third dimension constant as 1.2 meters, thinking that a mobile user uses a mobile at a certain height, and when he's moving, he's at yeah. using that height at the same height. So we didn't play with the Z coordinate and say it's constant, and we are dealing with uh, his moving X Y coordinate. I have one more question. I'm sorry. So this algorithm that you talk about, how do you apply that? I mean, is this it goes within a script and mm -hmm. and what in. kind of language you use? What kind of script? Uh, I use MATLAB for fingerprinting algorithm. Yeah, but you can use C, C++. But the ultra wideband uh, algorithms were all designed in C++ because we wanted real time implementation of the software and we wanted to bring it to the oscilloscope. So is there something else we can do that if we don't want to do C++? No. Uh, for location okay. fingerprinting, you can do MATLAB. I think it should MATLAB. work. And even the Kalman filter and everything works on MATLAB. 
Mm-hmm. I have I have made both the MATLAB and C++ softwares, but if you want to take it real time, then I think C++ is the language to go by, or Java, maybe. Sure. Java, I, yeah. I had the very same question over to Vika, and there are commercial and open source programs that will give that same information. You don't really have to write your own. Mm-hmm. Is, is the fingerprinting algorithm anything like the spectral analysis that they use for remote sensing, hyperspectral analysis? Fingerprinting, basically strings in different wavelengths. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure about the uh, spectra, what algorithm runs behind that, but in fingerprinting, they use two approach. One is the deterministic approach, where you uh, use the weighted average to find your location. Another is probabilistic, uh, probabilistic approach, where you say, what is the probability that I am in this location if I'm getting this signal strength? So there, there are two approach, but uh, to find the details, this report I have here in the references gives you a detail and the mathematics behind both these approaches and how the fingerprinting algorithms take these uh, RSSI and gives you the XY. So I have a very detailed report, which is wireless land localization. So, so if you're using Wi-Fi, it seems to me that the majority of the cases is the real three-meter accuracy, but in is also using Wi-Fi. In theory, maybe local, specifically localized points where you're actually blocking the signals on your Wi-Fi emitters so that they actually only travel within a smaller area. And if you trigger that smaller area, um, could you then get a much greater accuracy? Yes, I think so. Yes, you can do that. But uh, for the in our project, for the purpose of our localization, we didn't wanted to do this and we didn't have to do it because it was sufficient accuracy we were getting but your idea might work does the band a b or n or g make any difference at all to your knowledge wi-fi has different yeah signals different basically. signals yeah so but it's all the same from your point of view so i have a question related to the industry so this question was sort of about like geofencing triggering mm-hmm. based on the signals but i have a question about Visualizing the results. Yeah. So I was thinking that if you could show one of the floors, it doesn't mm-hmm. matter which which one. <clears throat> yeah. This so one? Yeah. So let's say you're on this floor, right? And you're you're moving around the floor, <clears throat> and couldn't you just sort of parcel the whole space so that you know your accuracy would be such that you'd know which section you're in based on the signal strengths. It wouldn't be like within three meters perhaps, but you'd know almost for sure that you're in this one and not this one. Yeah. And you, I, pick, you pick the cut points exactly based on what your signal processing results were so that you'd be like very high accuracy to know that you're in this section of the hall and not that section. Couldn't you just do that with the results and then you don't have to like really worry about some of these other parameters? Yeah. So that was the next step which was supposed to be done in this project was subspacing of this yeah. entire subspacing. layer because subspacing will uh, increase your accuracy. And uh, it will be, uh, you'll know exactly which section you are. But uh, we had to complete this project in six months. Right. So we ran out of time to do really do the subspacing for the entire building and come up with that. But so, that will increase the accuracy, I guess. So you're saying you take a GPS and say, I know I'm in this area, so I can focus on these two patterns for that area. I'm saying, I'm saying like, for based on the, on the, the results of your interpretations, right, after you've run all the algorithms on your pre-calculations, you basically can find cut points where, you know, based on the signal strengths that you're likely to receive, you know for sure you're in this section and not the next. Okay. And if you found but the correct the cut points, difference? then the results that you presented to the user would almost always be right. Yeah, but, but you are asked the question, off. what section of the building am I in? But you're, you're trading off accuracy yeah. from yeah. precision, right? right? You're giving up precision right. Right. to gain accuracy. Right. You know you're on the first floor, 100% certain. Yeah, but then I'm not knowing. It would be useful to me to know that I'm either next to these four rooms or next to the next. I think an RFID system might do that for you. Versus a signal that tells me I'm I'm here, like, within five meters, you know, which is like, you know. Within five meters, you better than just in this section. A practical use of just a uh, they were going to do that too. I don't know. Why. No, we were going to do it because uh, uh, we wanted to get, uh, we wanted to do the subspacing of this uh, to increase the accuracy. But at the same time, there is a cutoff of this that you can increase on your accuracy, but you might lose on your position, as when he's pointing out. But.
wonder. But one know. of the main motives of this is to be more and more accurate, more and more close to the local. Well, more and more accurate is not more and more precise. Yeah. Those are two concepts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you're speaking. Do you know, do you know what the technology, Jim? The, what, the facilities, one mm -hmm. of the facilities with people here at Harvard is seeking out these beacons, yeah. locational yeah. beacons. Yeah. What, yeah. 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 Well, that's my question. Yeah. What, are, what, what frequency are they? Do you know? They're going to have a presentation. There's a fellow yeah. in the museum studies program that's done this. Well, those, yeah. are, those are frequencies of light, right? No. That's a different thing, and that's, that's also a, that's a different yeah. thing.